Okay, this should be better now. I hope you can hear me now. Um, uh, I apologize for my technical tomfoolery here. Um, what I was saying was that uh, I've decided to try to do as a personal practice a daily Q&A at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, we'll see how that goes. I'm not sure I can do it every day. And uh, I certainly uh, will not be able to do it in the middle of February because on the 14th of February, uh, I'm having my ankle replaced. And the 13th, uh, I won't be available because I'll be getting ready for that surgery. And so, uh, but, and we'll say this is going to be on weekdays, not necessarily on weekends. I may do catch as catch can sessions on weekends but I'm reading in Dr. Young's work every day and uh, I want to share some things that I'm coming up against and um, I want to express my ideas about it and so uh, I thought I would do this and maybe we could develop a following over a period of time so uh, for the time being, uh, on weekdays, I'm going to do my best to be here at 1.30 p.m. or uh, at least on this uh, link, I will be putting a notice about when the next time is. Um, and, uh, you know, it may work, it may not, it may be too much. Uh, today I had a lot of things after I decided to do this, I had a lot of things come up, and so I didn't get to prepare fully. And um, so that wasn't good. Um, the cover, cover message here um, comes from, the cover message came from a, something I saw about, um, the year 2000. I think it was Google that did it uh, at a big international trade show and they uh, it was a big tech conference and they had blimps going around the trade show so I, saying um, uh, no I guess it wasn't Google it was a it was a database uh, company and they had blimps going around this trade show saying um, everyone knows that bilge pumps suck. Uh, what most people don't know is that most database programs operate in the same fashion. <laughs> thought that was a pretty good one. Um, and uh, I don't know if they've improved that much. I've been using databases for a long, long time. Um, but they're certainly better than they were in 2000. But in any case, uh, the reason this came to mind today was that uh, Senator Joe Manchin, in connection with something that was happening politically today in the United States, um, was talking about how Washington sucks. And what I wanted to first explain is that everything sucks, actually. Um, because uh, if you look around your room uh, today and look at all the items with the exception of possibly uh, living plants, uh, but including fake plants, um, everything that you can see, you can probably also think of a way of improving. And so in that sense, uh, all of us can imagine a better something for everything that we look at in our room. And that includes the people. Obviously, all of us can improve somewhat, but, uh, but everything came from the human imagination. And so everything that's manifest in this room, uh, in my room, for example, like I have my glass of water, well, this glass was first designed by someone and then uh, they had to design a tool that would produce that glass. And 
obviously the design could have been an infinite number of other possibilities, but uh, we don't have to go into those. But the idea is that everything that's manifest came from the human psyche and everything that um, is manifest, well, okay, everything came from the human psyche and uh, that includes civilization. And so we need to be a little bit understanding, but then obviously in the United States, uh, we have this huge national neurosis between the Republican and Democratic parties. And it's gotten worse and we've been going back and forth. And so I thought it would be useful to talk about um, about how those things are solved on an individual basis, on an individual um, therapy basis, and to then understand what can be done about the current situation. It can't go on as it is, obviously, and it, it can be a problem. So uh, I've been reading today a book that my mother-in-law gave me for Christmas, Alchemical Studies, which is the first book of, about alchemy that Dr. Jung uh, wrote. And um, it, it's the only one I hadn't read. I've read um, uh, Psychology and Alchemy and also Mysterium Conjunctionis, and, uh, but I wanted to go back to the beginning and so they're very, at the very beginning, there's a couple of paragraphs that can help us out here. Okay, the first one is that uh, we develop a certain one-sidedness about problems. And this comes up in the opposites. So I'm just going to read this for the benefit of people that are only listening to this. Um, Dr. Young says, a consciousness heightened by an inevitable one-sidedness gets so far out of touch with the primordial images that a breakdown ensues. Long before the actual catastrophe, mm -hmm. the signs of error announce themselves in atrophy of instinct, nervousness, disorientation, entanglement with impossible situations and problems. Medical investigation then discovers an unconscious that is in full revolt against the conscious values and that therefore cannot possibly be assimilated into, into consciousness while the reverse is altogether out of the question. We are confronted with an apparently irreconcilable conflict before which human reason stands helpless with nothing to offer except sham solutions and dubious compromises. And that's from uh, paragraph 15 of Alchemical Studies. So, um, so uh, that's what we have. We have this um, duality. It can't be resolved by reason. Uh, but there are solutions. There is psychological solution and uh, what Dr. Jung offered in this uh, same section is that normally um, one can outgrow the problem. He says, I have often seen patients, uh, I'm sorry I, I mistyped this, but I've often seen patients simply outgrow a problem that had destroyed others. This outgrowing, as I formally called it, proved on further investigation to be a new level of consciousness. Some higher and wider interest appeared on the patient's horizon, and through this broadening of his outlook, the insoluble problem lost its urgency. It was not solved logically on its own terms, but faded out when confronted with a new and stronger life urge. It was not repressed or made unconscious, but merely appeared in a different light, and so really did become different. And 
So in terms of governments that have um, these insoluble problems like we've been discussing, um, the classic solution is uh, to have a war. Because if you have a war, then everybody will um, run to the flag, everyone sees the outside enemy, and, um, and people will forget their domestic problems. And uh, I actually found a place, although I can't find it anymore, uh, but it's, it's in um, Thucydides' uh, history of the Peloponnesian Wars. It's actually mentioned there that uh, governments, if they are having domestic problems, uh, what they will do is have a war. And it's quite evident that the current administration in the United States would love nothing better than to have a war because uh, then, then we blame others for our own problems. And uh, so he's certainly been trying to cook up something in Korea and uh, there's evidence that he would also like to have a war with Iran. Either one would serve the purpose. Um, and so uh, what we need is this new level of consciousness and um, it's not going to be solved by uh, just piling more stuff in either the Republican or the Democratic basket. I think a lot of people think that, okay, maybe we'll just outweigh the other one by uh, people will be more interested in watching M MSNBC than Fox News or vice versa, and then the scales will um, balance out more in one way or the other way. And as you see, what we have is um, just bouncing back and forth because um, obviously there was an imbalance, uh, this unconscious imbalance uh, before the election in 2016, uh, which is what caused um, the election of Donald Trump in the first place. And then once he was elected, that caused an immediate reaction on the other side, which uh, resulted in the Women's March the day after his election and, and more disruption uh, since then. And so uh, the question is, how can this be resolved? Well, it might be resolved um, by whatever happens from uh, the Robert Mueller investigation. Either way, um, we may grow out of the current crisis with, uh, that we all perceive in the government um, by whatever happens. I mean, if, if um, Robert Mueller was to give a clean bill of health to both the president and his uh, team, then, um, you know, a lot of folks would probably grumble, but we'd have to grow, we'd have to outgrow it. And, um, and, but the other, other way we know that uh, if it comes out as uh, indictments for many people, which is uh, more what my sense is of what will happen, uh, then you're going to have, uh, you know, more disruption, but ultimately it will be over. I mean, it's like uh, the 60s when uh, we were pursuing the Vietnam War and both parties were pursuing it. We'll not kid ourselves because it actually started, the Vietnam War actually started in the, in the 50s, uh, right after uh, the French lost Vietnam, the, after Dien Bien Phu in 1954, then um, the U.S. started to pick up the cudgels on this imagined uh, idea that there would be uh, dominoes falling to 
communism in Southeast Asia, and therefore we had to fight back. And so uh, actually it was the Eisenhower administration that started to make a few efforts, and then the uh, Kennedy administration did more. Um, certainly I can attest to that because I was uh, in Japan uh, living near the, the headquarters of the Seventh Fleet um, and one day in the summer of 1962 uh, my father, now this is 1962 mind you, uh, my father took me down to the pier in Yokosuka on the Navy base there and pointed out a line of ships going out of Tokyo Harbor uh, or, and um, out of Tokyo Bay and he said see that and I said yeah Dad. he says that's the Marines they're going to Vietnam he said everyone who is in the military has either been to Vietnam is there now or is going there and he my father was a commander in the Navy at the time and had been to Vietnam as part of his duties from Japan and uh, fortunately only on a, a short stay of three weeks uh, but he made that comment to me and I, so I said why dad and he said because the generals and the admirals need a war in order to make uh, promotions <laughs> I said oh okay <laughs> well that's the that's the perception of a military guy. Um, but anyway, um, what Dr. Jung pointed out is that we can rise above these things, but we can't rise above them if, we, if someone um, starts a war. Okay? If they start a war, then the American people will pull together and uh, we'll all be one thing for a short period of time for the duration of the war. And we can all hope that we would survive such a situation. Um, and um, obviously we'll outgrow, it, we'll outgrow it after the results of um, whatever happens in this Russia uh, investigation. And um, so I guess that's all I wanted to talk about for examples uh, right now. Let me go back and just see if, um, uh, see what you've said. And uh, then we'll see, see if there's anything to be done today. Hey, Mikey says the political opposites need to be reconciled. And um, the point is that, yes, they do need to be reconciled. Uh, and Dr. Jung's point is that's not going to happen through a rational process. It's going to have to come from imagination. So we all have to imagine what the United States will be like for our grandchildren. Okay. Um, you know, people that have a racist attitude in the United States, for example, um, you know, that, that can't be right because, um, among other things, I mean, just in self-interest for those people, um, people of color are going to be the majority in this country by the year 2050, maybe earlier. And um, they may resent the way they've been treated. Um, and the good news is that, that there is transformation. Transformation does occur. Um, in 1968, when I came on active duty in the Marine Corps, uh, I came through Washington and we had Resurrection City on the Washington Mall. And 300,000 people were living there in tents and you couldn't go east of the U.S. Supreme Court on Capitol Hill without taking your life in your hands in those days uh, because the city was so divided. That has vastly changed since then. Um, 
And when I came back to Washington in 1986, uh, my wife and I lived one mile east of the Capitol. And uh, you know, we, we shopped in an uh, area of the city that had been a traditionally black area of the city. And indeed, uh, Washington, D.C.'s population is very, uh, has a majority of black residents, but we were able to live um, basically in peace <laughs> on Capitol Hill. I mean, that's that's a little bit of a lie because uh, one of the reasons that we moved out was we were the victims of uh, 15 crimes in 10 years, um, most of them petty, but one which involved us being robbed and the next people or the next person that was robbed after us 10 minutes later was shot dead by the assailants. So, um, you know, things were not perfect, but uh, they have been steadily improving. Race relations in the United States have steadily improved, um, and uh, they are going to continue to improve, except where people keep stirring them up. Okay. Um, So Mike Miles says, I think the life urge for something higher manifests in our unconscious and we are hearing it whisper, guides us to make decisions that at the moment seem to be bad decisions. What do you think? Um, I think that that's largely true. I mean, the self, whether it's the individual self for our individual lives or our national self in terms of uh, uh, what is manifesting in our country uh, is something that it's that is emerging and I think in the United States I mean I came home uh, from my session on Monday night and my wife was in tears mm -hmm. from uh, what she had been watching on television about the developments of that day in the administration. And uh, it's, uh, she, my wife isn't a very teary kind of woman. And so it's, it's very painful for me to see her in that way. But um, obviously something new has to emerge. Humpty Dumpty has uh, fallen and is, is in shards off the wall and we're not going to be able to put the country back together the way it was. And so something new has to emerge, and that has to emerge in the imagination of the American people. And I think it's being forced to uh, emerge. I think it's very painful right now. It emerges through bad decisions and good decisions. I mean, as Winston Churchill once said, Americans always make the right decision after trying everything else. And so obviously there was a neurosis long before the election of 2016. Uh, and it, the eruption that Dr. Jung was talking about in this uh, slide, I mean, I'll put it up again just so you can see it, um, the eruption that um, blew up as a result of that um, is has now already had a big swing back in terms of um, the our consciousness about it and I, and saying whoa that's not what I wanted when we got the president I mean people expect the president of the United States to be interested in the welfare of all Americans, and instead we have a man that seems to be interested, only has self-interest. And um, that is very troubling to a lot of Americans at a very deep level. And, you know, something new is going to emerge from that. It's not going to be the way it, it was in the past. Um, some scientists say, Miles says, some scientists say that if half a percent of the nukes 
are ever used that will tip the climate irre irre irrevocably. Well, there are a lot of things that can tip the climate irrevocably, but, um, but you know, even half a percent of all the nukes being fired might lead to um, the, dev the devolution of our species. And I think that a lot of mature, very smart people know that. And um, that's why we haven't had any more use of nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, uh, we have a president who hasn't been brought up in the way politicians normally are brought up. And so he says, why not? Why don't we do it? Well, there are a thousand reasons why we don't do it. And, you know, we expect our leaders to have the maturity to understand that. Um, and uh, I used to worry about it, honestly. I worried about it uh, until I was in my early 40s. And uh, in my 40s, um, I went to the National War College. And right at that time, there was a popular movie called War Games. Um, and it had uh, Michael J. Fox, I think, uh, in it as a very young man. And, um, and the premise was that a computer gets out of control and it gives a, f a false warning like we had in Hawaii uh, a couple weeks back. And that causes world, or almost causes World War III. And then in the movie, it, at the last minute, people realize that it's a computer glitch. And so that was very topical at the time that I was mm -hmm. at the National War College. So I was talking with a couple of senior officers about it. And uh, one of them said, oh, don't worry about that. And I said, why? And he says, well, the United States has a policy that we don't launch on warning. And um, I said, well, what does that mean? And he says, well, we would, we would not use nuclear weapons unless nu there were nuclear explosions in the United States. If there were nuclear explosions in the United States and we had been attacked with them, then we would use them, but not because of a threat. So the point is that Kim Jong-un can, uh, you know, wave his fists and um, say anything he wants about his nuclear power, but we're never going to launch a nuclear attack on him. And he probably knows that uh, unless he um, actually does something. If he actually does something, then he should stand by because then we'll make North Korea a parking lot. But um, but as long as he's he's just uh, you know sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt hurt us. As long as uh, he's only using words and histrionics, uh, we're we're not going to do anything. We'll be vigilant, surely. Um, and Miles says, your dad sounds like he would agree with Lieutenant Colonel Smedley Butler and war is a racket. Absolutely, and I agree entirely with that now. And um, I've been carrying a U.S. military ID card since I was 10 years old. And so that's now 61 years. And uh, uh, although I have tremendous respect for my fellow Marines and my fellow U.S. service members. I think that we are excellently trained and very mature in our outlook and approach to the world uh, as a group, as a group of people. Um, the uh, tool of the U.S. military has been used for the benefit of the military industrial complex. And uh, in that sense, it is, um, it is racket. And in Smedley Butler's day, Smedley Butler 
was a great Marine who uh, at one time was the most decorated Marine, I think. He was a Major General in the Marine Corps. And he um, was approached by industrialists uh, in, the, um, in the early 30s uh, to um, lead a rebellion and revolution in the United States and overthrow the U.S. government. He refused to do that. He blew the whistle on it, and, um, and it didn't happen. Um, I'm not going to talk about on this video because this is more about Jungian psychology, um, but you know there are some prominent American political families that are still around that were involved in that um, attempted coup d'etat uh, even in the early 30s. Um, if you look on, uh, on uh, Archetype and Action website, you can probably find one of them. Um, or an article that it says who it is, but uh, in any case, um, uh, it's an unfortunate truth that the military does um, support the military-industrial uh, complex. Now that's the negative side. The positive side is that, um, you know, the military also keeps us um, safe from uh, other governments who have the same issue uh, but would gladly uh, make us all slaves and uh, you know those governments have existed since long before Roman times actually that's the way human beings have been we're, we're quarrelsome bunch of creatures and so we we need a military industrial complex uh, to a certain degree but like anything I mean like all opposites we have to keep these things in balance and uh, in my experience in the US military um, I believe that all the Marines that I ever met um, believed in that balance um, and I certainly did and um, you know the, I can have I can argue both sides on the on the Vietnam War um, I was I went to a little lefty college in upstate New York and at that college uh, uh, I was a Navy junior so I was always going into the military there was no question that I would go into the military and it wasn't because my father ever said one word to me about it um, but you know, like father, like son, so um, I always wanted to serve and actually I thought the people that were uh, demonstrating in, against the Vietnam War were traitors and uh, that's the way I felt at the time. And also, um, I, because, because of my experience in 62, where my father said, there go the ships, um, I always knew that there was something that was rotten in Del Denmark about the Vietnam War, but I wanted to go and find out for myself why, why it was wrong, so that I could apply those lessons in my own life, which I have done. And uh, while I was there, I definitely found out what was wrong uh, with the Vietnam War and it was nothing none of the things that were expressed by the by the left by the by the extreme demonstrators at that time they didn't know and a lot of the people that demonstrated during the Vietnam War um, you know were simply people that were trying to avoid um, service and uh, for their own, you know, to keep themselves safe. I wanted to keep myself safe too, uh, but I believed that I had to serve as a, as a duty. And ironically, my best friend in life uh, did, he was the son of a, 
of a uh, W-4 30-year Navy man who was the um, staff secretary of, he was the staff secretary of the um, Seventh Fleet when we were in Japan together, and um, he went to Canada, and he never came back. He still lives uh, in northern British Columbia, and he's still my best friend in life. And um, in retrospect, I think the people that demonstrated against the Vietnam War were the right had the right answer. Um, but would I make a different decision um, if it was 1967 again? I don't know. If I knew then what I know now, I still don't know uh, because it's a it's a balance. We have to balance these things. Okay, so. Um, Jerome says we need a national goal other than war that unites. I remember Kennedy's race to land a man on the moon. I absolutely agree with you, Jerome. And also, um, I haven't understood why we don't spend more on the space program uh, because that was such an organizing um, endeavor for the country. It may have saved the country because you know, during the 60s, uh, things were so divisive, and, and the space program is one thing that held us together and gave us pride in the country at that time. And so, um, you know, and for all the jobs that, that the moonshot uh, created in, the, um, in NASA, there were there was over a million jobs uh, created by the moon landing in private industry. And you have to appreciate private industry in order to understand the power of something like that. Because we only landed six spacecraft on the moon and uh, 12 men did it. And yet uh, it just, created huge industries, it, it advanced our uh, computer, our software programming, our computer hardware manufacturer, everything that, that uh, developed out of American industry in the 60s um, is still with us and it, we're still the strongest country in the world on most of those things. Um, and, you know, yes, China manufactures iPhones, but they didn't develop iPhones, and um, there's no real sign that they have any innovation that everyone in the world would want. Uh, you know, they, they make great iPhones, which is a terrific role in itself in society, um, but the dynamism of the American system is huge and you have to um, just imagine what this is like. Like I, I used to work in the auto industry and one of the uh, companies that, or the company that I mainly worked for in Japan um, was a company that made uh, weather stripping and one of the things that made was uh, the rubber stuff that goes around your windshield and your car door and uh, your car windows. So we made that material. And it seems like, a, you know, just a inconsequential item. But in order to make a rubber weather stripping to go around your car door, uh, you either have to extrude it or mold it. And the factories that we had to have just to produce those we had 16 factories in the United States and abroad, um, and um, of those factories, um, they were huge. I mean, they're 400 feet long and, and 100 feet wide, and they have these huge Banbury mixers that create, that make the rubber that goes through the extruding machine or into the mold, and, and they employed a lot of people. And so you just, when you drive your automobile, you just cannot appreciate the tens of thousands of people that were involved in building that 
device that you're driving. It's just phenomenal. And so I entirely agree that we need a new moonshot. Uh, okay, Miles says, your study of Jung has helped you be a, to be a better person as well as a better lawyer. What do you think? Um, well, I don't think it made me a better lawyer because I actually gave up the formal practice of law in 1979 except for my own personal issues. Mm -hmm. And um, someday I'll talk about those, but I'm, I can't do it right now. Um, but uh, I actually detest the practice of law, to be very honest. And, um, you know, this is something that we have to do better in uh, identifying the people that are suited for different professions uh, because I loved the challenge of going to law school. It was very uh, logical, thinking oriented. And so I loved going to law school. Once I practiced law, and I did it for five years, uh, from 1975 to 1980, um, I absolutely detested it, and I knew it very soon. I, uh, I started to go to business school in my third year of practicing law, and as soon as I had my MBA, I, had, I took my job and went to Japan to run a company. And um, it was at a time when um, uh, Congressman Gebhardt um, was talking about Japanese non-tariff barriers and how unfair they were. And, you know, I got to Japan and I didn't think they were unfair at all. And I never met a non-tariff barrier I didn't like. <laughs> and I actually started um, about 200 different product lines in five years in four different industries. And I created two manufacturing facilities in the Tokyo region. Uh, in addition to uh, supporting a manufacturing facility that had been in the company for 10 years before I went to Japan. And, um, and so, uh, you know, just proved that Gebhardt was wrong. And I remember him, you know, with an axe in front of the U.S. Capitol one day, whacking away at a Japanese television set, for example. And, you know, that wasn't the answer. Um, but we weren't very smart about what we did in those days. We still aren't very smart. Let's hope we can get better gradually. Um, as far as it making me a better person, um, well, I'll leave it for others to judge, but it, in terms of my life and how I feel about it, um, you know, I've been through some tough times. Um, and, um, you know, just going back to, to I mean, just my childhood, I, you know, I moved way too many times in my childhood and lived all over the country, traveled through the country. I had been across the country uh, twice in an automobile before I was five years old, and or before I was six years old, let's say. And um, I had lived in Kodiak, Alaska in 1952 and 53, um, back when it wasn't the posh Coast Guard base it is today. I mean, actually, I wouldn't say it's posh even today, but in those days it was, uh, we lived uh, for the first four months in a skid shack that was used by ice fishermen. So it was a, a shack that was on skids and you could tow it around. And it had three small rooms, and the only heat in it was a kerosene heater in the living room. And so, you know, I've been through some very tough times over, over the years in different ways. Obviously, if you go to war, 
and you're going into battle, you're facing the possibility of your instant death. And it happened to my roommate from the basic school. He uh, was, he literally had his head blown off by the uh, Viet Cong about five months after we graduated from the basic school as second lieutenants. And um, so when you're looking death in the eye, there, you know, there's a lot of stress. And fortunately for me, at some point in this process, I started to learn about Dr. Jung. And anyway, since 1990 especially, I started to really study it in 87. But in 1990, I got Man and His Symbols, and I read it to my wife for a year uh, at night as we were going to sleep, three or four pages a night. And at the end of the year, I felt like I had had a year of psychotherapy. And these days, um, I always have a young book quite close to me. And if ever I'm in a stressful situation, if I open any young book, it makes me feel more uh, confident and, and calms me down. So um, as you see, I've actually been possessed by Dr. Jung's oeuvre. I couldn't say it any less emphatically than that. And um, this YouTube channel is an outgrowth of that. My, my wife saw me uh, cooking, 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 cooking at home for several years and said, you got to find somebody to talk to about your interest in young. And, and so I started the, the reading group and lo and behold, we've, someone's always showed up at the, uh, at the meetups that I've conducted. And uh, one of the things I hope will happen is that perhaps some of you who are watching this will actually, um, create meeting groups of your own and I'll certainly help you with materials and so on. Obviously there's a wealth of materials in the Dropbox that I created for the uh, for the group so there's plenty to work with if you d ever decide to do it and all I did was start taking my iPhone and aiming it at myself when I was talking and that's turned out to to generate a following. Um, So, let's see. Do uh, Miles says, do you do you use Jung's teaching as a measuring stick to hold up to people in your life or your leaders? Um, I wouldn't call it a measuring stick, perhaps per se. I think it gives me a broader imagination than many people have in terms of understanding uh, the problems uh, that we face in the world. And, um, you know, I've tried to make, I've tried to manifest what I've thought about it. I actually wrote a book in 2014, or published a book called um, Political Psychology, New Ideas for Activists. Nobody bought it. It's, you can have it for free on, um, on the Dropbox if you're a member of our Dropbox. And, um, uh, but, you know, but what I found out was approaching it in that way didn't get anybody to pay attention. And what has gotten people to pay attention is actually these Q and A's. So I was doing a year and a half of local work with my group and gradually I found that, um, there was a following online, but uh, this is the seventh time I've done a Q&A, and it, my God, the Q&As I've done have been the most popular thing I've done. So I think, you know, putting myself out there to the world has been the most effective way of communicating, uh, not the written word. And so I plan to do more of it, as I said earlier. Um, I would um, 
try to do it every day. I don't know if I can, but we'll we'll see. It'll it'll be an aspiration, and I'll leave a message on this link uh, when I think it can and can't be. Um, but we'll aim for one thirty. By by the way, it. It is getting cumbersome to be able to notify people when I'm going to be online. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of calls on my time, even though we're only in the beginnings of this. And so I urge you to both su subscribe to the YouTube channel and click on the little bell thing that's next to the subscription link. Uh, because that will give you notice when we're, I'm going to be online. And I'll try to leave on the image on that page a notice about when the next time will be, um, at least a few hours before I go online. Um, let's see, Miles, sorry, I was thinking you are sitting in your law office right now, all the books and papers. And I guess you mentioned law in a previous webcast. Wow, get to hear about your business venture. Well, yeah, I have a lot of stories, Miles. <laughs> but no, this isn't my law office. This is uh, my wife's and my uh, study in our home. And um, uh, I'm, I'm not going to the office anymore. I'm officially retired, but... Um, I don't, I'm not saying that that will always be the case, but, um, you know, as a, right now, I'm uh, living on my Social Security and Marine Corps retirement. So, um, Miles says, I can relate. My wife also says enough already when I talk about existentialism. <laughs> yeah, we don't have enough... Uh, people to talk with and uh, therefore uh, some of my group members really uh, rely on the group meeting in order to um, have someone around that they can talk to and so I um, you know I live in a smaller city I live in Annapolis Maryland the population of the city is only 78,000 even though it's the capital of the state of Maryland, uh, we do have in the county about 600,000. So there are a lot of people around, but close in to where I live, uh, it's a very small community. And yet uh, I was able to use this system called meetup.com, uh, meetup and uh, I'll put that link into the uh, chat so that you can see it and check it check it out online um, it's a great system it's apparently operating all over the world and I just you know put up an announcement that I was going to do this um, this session every week and uh, lo and behold I had eight people the first time and uh, interestingly, five of them were psychotherapists who I think were trying to check out the competition. <laughs> and and uh, they sort of lost interest when they realized I wasn't trying to be a psychotherapist. And, uh, and I don't. I, because uh, I'm not a psychotherapist, I try to assiduously avoid uh, psychotherapy or dream analysis, anything like that except for my own dream, sometimes I'll do that. Um, but, uh, you know, anyway, I think it's a way to attract people who are interested in talking about it, intellectual issues, and gradually I think we can make an impact. Um, and so, let's see. Um, Young for Activism, my book on drop sounds interesting. Yeah, it's, anyway, it's there. Uh, just be careful you don't pick up any of my uh, adult material. <laughs> Unless you're interested, but um, just be warned. Uh, the uh, political psychology, new ideas for activists, uh, you know, 
It contains uh, about 50 of my essays that I wrote over a period of time, uh, mostly about American politics, but I think it offers some wisdom in there. Um, and Jerome says, uh, these, these times is an opportunity for individuals to examine how their own shadow may be influencing or blocking higher consciousness development. I definitely agree with that. And, you know, as I have said a couple of times, um, you know, I have to look at the president and even though I don't like a lot of things that he does um, and his attitude toward average people, um, I have to admit that if I were in his situation as he grew up, I could very easily have made similar choices. And so I do recognize him as a manifestation of my personal shadow. And um, I recognize the situation politically as a manifestation of our national shadow. Uh, and, you know, you can't fix a problem unless you know you have one. And so what any way this has produced since the election of 2016 is that we do have a problem. And if we want our grandchildren to live in peace and to respect one another and their fellow Americans, then we do have to... Um, examine ourselves because where did that all come from? It came from us. Um, so anyway, uh, so I guess, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just rambling at the moment. So I'm going to uh, sign off for the moment. And um, I decided to keep it simple today, partially because I ran out of time and partially because I think if I keep these conversations shorter, um, it'll be more meaningful to everyone. And so uh, I'll just leave you with this message uh, about outgrowing the problem because it applies to um, both our country and our own individual problems, whether it be with a spouse or whatever, um, that we, uh, the way that we can advance is to realize that we're never going to finally solve these things. They're insoluble, and I'll go on with some of the material uh, that's here in this book uh, tomorrow. But um, suffice it to say that many of life's problems are insoluble, and what keeps us moving is the fact that we live in, in a field of opposites, and that's where our psychic energy comes from. And so maybe I ought to talk about that a little bit again. But um, so, you know, I'll do the insoluble problems of life. Um, so many of them are not solvable, and we just have to grow up and mature and be able to face our problems as adults. And that's our job as adults. Um, so, anyway, um, I seeing no further comment from anyone, I'm going to go ahead and uh, terminate the session now, and uh, I'll talk to you again prob probably tomorrow, I hope so.